Things may be getting complicated soon. The churches or businesses that have faithful people in charge of them. It would seem that there are some legislation currently moving through our government that it's going to make it very difficult for people who want to express the truth. I'm not saying that in a way to be depressing or demeaning or anything, but it seems that it's... Well, I'll say it this way. Y'all know me. I grew up here. And not once in the entirety of all the time that I've been at this church in my life has anybody ever said anything to me which would be demeaning or disrespectful or, or, or disparaging of anybody of a different race, a different nationality, even people who struggle with parts of their sexuality. Never, not even once, have I heard it spoken here. But yet, because we are people who believe that there is truth, there are certain things that we cannot change. There are things we have to stand on, and those things are the things we find in God's Word. Now, the stuff going through Congress right now has to do with the language uh, around uh, the LGBT community, human sexuality, and the way that we express, you know, God's view on human sexuality in the Bible is the way we're going to go. Celibacy and singleness. Faithfulness in the marriage between one man and one woman. That is how the Bible expresses to us we should live. We're not here to point out other things, but what God calls sin is sin. We don't get to decide that. And so I think that in the days to come, we will find things more and more difficult because the, 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 the bill that's being sought now, uh, in, it's, it's called an equality bill, but it says that includes places of gathering in the types of operations and businesses that will be affected by this law. And we are a place of gathering. Pretty soon it's going to be unacceptable in the society around us to call sin, sin. Which to me is heartbreaking. Because it seems like it's going to bring us up against people who we love very much when really the best thing we can do is have face-to-face -face personal loving conversations about who Jesus is rather than having to always feel like we have to resort to these back and forth arguments. How many of y'all have had uncomfortable Thanksgiving or, or, or Christmas dinners because there were two different political sides at the table? But are we trapped in that conversation? Our title, I know, is a bit unusual today, but I think you'll start to understand something. Jesus actually had to deal with a similar thing. Uh, in John chapter 8, starting in verse 2, it says this. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? In 
This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. I will pause and say that there are theologians in this world that would give their left arm to know what he wrote on the ground. And as they continue to ask him, sounds like they're badgering him, doesn't it? Hmm. He stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. May God bless his word for our hearts and our spirits. So what we have here, the, one of the keys to understanding this is it said they were doing this to trap him, didn't it? They were bringing this woman to trap him. And, 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 I, and I see a, a very dangerous thing happening because they already had their stones and they were ready to kill her. But here's the problem. Well, actually there's a couple of problems in my mind. The first one that I always get whenever I read this is where's the dude? <laughs> this is not a one party sin. Matter of fact, I went through and checked and, and it, it and Deuteronomy and Leviticus both called for the man and the woman to both be executed. Both places where it's mentioned. Where's the dude? So already we've got an idea that this is not being enforced equally, is it? Somebody is fudging the scales a little bit. But the other thing that's in the background that we probably need to be aware of is that in Jesus' day, the Romans had removed from the local populations the ability to give a death sentence for anything. That had to always go through uh, the government at some level, the government justice system instead of the locals. And so those men standing there with these stones, they were creating a situation for Jesus because what it was going to come down to was Jesus either had to be uh, a supportive of what the law says or he had to betray what the law says. He had to become a traitor to the law. But if he supported what the law of Moses said, he would be a rebel to the Roman government. So this was a cleverly designed trap, and it's what we call a prison of two ideas, though. And we forget, we forget all the time that God is much bigger than our ideas. As Christians, do we ever feel trapped between two ideas? Do we feel like we're pitted against something? I'll give you an example that, that, that I get hit with frequently, Okay. And this is going back to the political discourse in our country. It seems like if you are a conservative Republican, you can't be concerned with people who are poor. Does that seem what it feels like people are saying? Yeah, we get accused of that all the time. Oop, did I just give that away? <laughs> My bad. But then on the other side of that, there's also the argument that there are those who, uh, you know, if you support the Democrat side of things, then you always have to be completely 100% in support of abortion. And I will tell you in my experience that there are good Christian people on the Democrat side of the aisle who do not believe 
in abortion. Good, faithful people. And so what we see is our political discourse is trying to trap us uh, and, and, and force us to have this fight with each other when where should our allegiance ultimately belong? Yeah. yeah, don't be a Democrat or Republican, folks. Don't be libertarian. Pull yourself back from those ideas because um, they have the tendency to trap us against each other. That's not who, that's not who God's called us to be. I love y'all, and I'm, I know where a, a good chunk of y'all's affiliations lie. But I really feel like this is something we have to be wary of because we see right here in the scriptures that they're trying to use this to trap Jesus. And this is going to be a lethal trap for somebody. They got rocks in their hands for one woman and a cross ready for Jesus on the other side of it. Weird how these same things keep coming up over and over again, isn't it? The good thing is, is that Jesus' perspective, it's, un, it's an unequal enforcement as well. We have an unequal enforcement on one side because it's like, where's the guy? There's some inequality there because he needs to be there and answer for his side of things. There's a rock with his name on it too. But God actually does not enforce things equally with us either. And the reason I say that, it goes back to, uh, if we look in verses 10 and 11 here, they, the word condemn shows up twice. And it's the same word uh, in the Greek. It's katakrino. Uh, but it's, it, it, can, it has two, uh, two available meanings. The first one is judgment, which is what we're kind of looking at and we normally read it as, right? Judgment. But you have to add this other part to it. It means to judge somebody, but to do so by being so good and showing off so much goodness within yourself that it makes the other person look bad. That's the word we're dealing with. And so what they're saying is, is they're bringing this woman in front of Jesus and they're they're using this ideology that says we're being such a great example. Look at this woman and the bad things that she's done. She is worthy of death. And what is Jesus' response? Which one of you has no sin? Feel free to cast the first stone. Wait, cast the first stone for the, the, the sinless person. Please. And in the words of the late Mike Warnke, they dropped their rocks and split. Why couldn't they condemn her? Because it ultimately had nothing to do with their public example. It had to do with the sin in their heart. And Jesus called that to the front. He said, ah, ha, ha. hold on a second before you do this, guys. Ultimately, it's about sin. It's about what separates us from God. The reason I say that this is unequal enforcement is because the next time he says it, uh, when, when he asks this woman, uh, has no one condemned you? He's the one who is the example that is superlative above all other examples. If there was a sinless person, it's him. He's the one who could say, I'm going to throw a stone. Because the example of myself is holy and righteous. And what does he choose to do? I'm not going to condemn you either. So on one side, we have a group that wants unequal enforcement, but it leads to death. And here we have unequal enforcement, but it leads to life. What Jesus is showing us, instead of dependence upon the law, 
we have dependence upon the mercy and the grace of God. In fact, it's explained even better in Romans 3, starting in verse 23. He says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. We've all sinned. There is not a person here today that does not have this over them. Yet God decided that he loves us. And, 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 and here's where we have to, to think about is the value that God places on us. He could have wiped us out and started over. But he didn't. He put something in place that was going to be hard and difficult. It would lead to the death of Jesus on the cross to make the payment for the sins, and he restores us to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ. God has decided our value. Sometimes I wrestle with what that means and how that works. But then I remember this part of my life. <laughs> this car still sits in my yard. <laughs> Sat in my dad's yard for 16 years. My grandma bought it new in 1985. It has 66,000 miles on it. I poured about $5,000 into it. It runs good. Well, not now. The battery's dead. But it looks better than in this picture right now. I haven't gotten it painted, but I washed it. Thank you. I didn't restore this car because it was going to be an investment. I didn't restore this car because um, it was going to win anything at the track. It's not set up for it. I restored this car because when I first moved out on my own, I moved into a place in Sanford off of Oakwood Avenue. Uh, back in the 90s, you didn't want to be on Oakwood Avenue at all if you could help it. Is it still that way? Well, let's just say I got beat up at the railroad tracks a few times. I didn't have a vehicle, and, um, but I could walk to work. And um, Once a week, my grandma would come and pick me up and take me to Yarbrough's Ice Cream for lunch. And I always remember riding in the, in, in the car and, and just having those times with her. And so the value that I have on this car isn't how much it's monetarily worth or anything like that. It's the memories that it brings. And I think in some way we have to realize that when God looks at us, and, and, you know, we have sin on us that needs to be dealt with, and he did that with Jesus. He's bringing us through the process of restoration, not because of anything that we can do or offer to him. All he simply wants is for us to love him. He remembers what it was like to be face-to-face -face with Adam and Eve and have that connection and that communion, and that's what he wants from all of us. And that is why he does what he does. He desires the restoration of humanity. And so he offers us his mercy and his grace. And I think we can see the pattern that he's looking for in this conversation because this woman got to meet Jesus face to face, didn't she? And when she met Jesus, what did she call him? Lord. 
Lord. She was forgiven by God, called him Lord, and the command from Jesus was to go and sin no more. That's the pattern that God calls us all to. He wants to meet us face to face. He wants to bring us to forgiveness and mercy and salvation and then be able to go and live a life outside of the grip of sin and death. There's no politics that can, that can describe that. There's no two-sided arguments there. There is simply just us and Jesus. Won't you consider the life with Christ that he calls you to? Won't you consider the love that he offers you, the mercy and the grace and the peace that you can only know through him? Let us pray. We thank you, God, that you have gone through so much to restore us to yourself. We ask, God, that you would help us to be very wise in these times. And help us to not be trapped in a prison of two ideas, but rather to be servants in the house of the living God. To be set free from sin and death. And to walk in this world as sheep among wolves, as lights in the darkness. We offer, O oh God, ourselves to you. We ask that your peace would reign in our lives. Give us your strength and your courage, Lord. We do not have enough of our own. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As we uh, come to our time of invitation, I will just uh, say that our steps are open by the altar if you wish to come and pray.